Hello and welcome to this uh, pre-recorded interview on Baketa Radio 91 FM, the voice of the church. I'm Damian Logale Henry Lodo. Uh, today we are going to talk about the United States of America foreign policy engagement towards South Sudan. It is now six years since South Sudan became an independent state following the Sudan Civil War, which lasted for 21 years. However, in December 2013, after becoming an independent state, South Sudan went back to war with itself following a political crisis between the president, Salva Kiir, and his then first vice president, Dr. Riyak Machar. Now, the renewed violence in Juba in July 2016 between government and opposition armed forces quickly spread to several parts of the country, resulting into the deaths of thousands and the displacement of millions both within and outside the country. The United States of America has been a leading country that backed South Sudan to obtain its independence from the North during its time of a struggle and also during CPA peace process. U.S. also played a significant role by pushing the warring parties to sign the agreement on the resolution of the conflict in the Republic of South Sudan in Egas 2015. And as the conflict continues, U.S. has been pushing the U.N. Security Council to impose sanctions on the leadership of South Sudan that includes asset freeze, travel bans, and arms embargo, among other things, for those believed to be responsible for the ongoing conflict in South Sudan. International human rights groups have accused both parties to the conflict of violating the peace agreement. So what is the U.S. which helped to birth this country doing to take it back to track? I'm joined in the studio by the outgoing U.S. Ambassador to South Sudan, Her Excellency Ambassador Mary Catherine Molly P. Ambassador Molly has been serving as U.S. Ambassador for South Sudan for over two years. Before coming to South Sudan, Ambassador P served as senior U.S. foreign diplomat in different capacities, including deputy chief of mission at the U.S. Embassy in Addis Ababa. Your Excellency, you're welcome to Bakita Radio. Thank you, Damien. I'm delighted to be here with you. I believe Bakita Radio plays an important role in communicating with the public in South Sudan, so I'm always honored to join you. I'm also very honored to host you for this special uh, interview. Your Excellency, you have been serving in South Sudan for the past two years. Tell us how it has been like. Well, before I speak about my specific experience, Damien, I want to refer to the great introduction you provided. So that allows me to make an important point. During your struggle uh, against the North, we supported you in two particular ways. We wanted to see an end to the conflict, and we wanted to see a return to the development of the people and land of the South Sudan. And that remains our two goals today. We, uh, now that you're fighting among yourselves, we also want to see an end to armed conflict and a return to the path of development so that you can be self-sufficient and not depend on outsiders uh, for assistance. Then, as you have mentioned, that U.S. has been backing South Sudan so that also in future they can be self-sufficient with themselves. Now, uh, as I mentioned in my introduction, uh, the United States of America was crucial in helping South Sudan achieve independence. Now, what are your thoughts about where we are as the country? Where did South Sudan go wrong? Well, I think my thoughts and the thoughts of most Americans are the same as the thoughts of most South Sudanese, which is that everyone is disappointed in the reality we see today. This is not what you fought for. You did not fight to see more than four million of your citizens displaced, either in this country or in neighboring countries, and you did not fight the North to see more than half your population, some six million people, suffering from severe food insecurity. That's the largest number ever in your history. So the question for everyone, Damien, is what can we do now? Uh, what will the leaders of your country do now, both the leaders in Juba and the leaders outside of the country, to change those statistics? Then I will ask you that same question you ask me now. In your own opinion, you have been ambassador here to South Sudan. I believe you also study the mindset of our leaders. What do you think is the appropriate uh, approach to help this country uh, come back to its normality? Well, I think in the word leadership uh, is the verb to lead. So I think it seems that the leaders here and the leaders who are outside the country need to make decisions that put the people of South Sudan first. Um, the easiest way to do that is for them to end armed conflict. However, 
we on the outside have been saying that for a long time and it doesn't seem to be having any impact. We've tried various ways to encourage an end to the conflict that broke out in December 2013. The first, as you mentioned, was to work with the parties and with your neighboring countries in the group known as EGAD to uh, forge a peace agreement and then to get the parties to sign the peace agreement and to begin implementing the peace agreement. That took up a substantial portion of the first year of my assignment here. Unfortunately, uh, the leaders didn't take advantage of the opportunity offered by the peace agreement and its most important element, which was and is a permanent ceasefire, collapsed. And as long as there is armed conflict, there are going to be the kind of terrible statistics we talk about because it has an immediate impact on people in terms of forcing them from their homes, but it has a secondary impact on your markets and your closed roads, which is what is causing the economic crisis today. The second thing we tried to do to end the armed conflict is we supported the regional protection force, and that was to be forces from friendly countries in the region to come here and help patrol the roads and protect critical infrastructure in Juba, and to create a sense of confidence in the town, in the region of Equatoria, uh, that you're about to get back to the serious work of pursuing peace. Unfortunately, we've seen many, many delays in the deployment of the regional protection force. So when uh, your friends like the United States tried all these different ways to encourage the parties to make peace and they were unresponsive, that was when there was discussion about punitive measures. Um, that's why there has been support for an arms embargo. As long as there is conflict, people will want to try and stop the conflict by trying to stop the supply of arms. And there will th thus be discussion about an arms embargo. As long as there are individual leaders who refuse uh, to take positive steps to pursue peace in the country, there will be talk about targeted sanctions. So those are some of the ways in which we've tried, both positive and through punitive measure, to encourage your leadership to end this conflict and move the country forward. Everyone wants South Sudan to succeed, and we're trying to push the leadership to take the steps that will make your country succeed. Your Excellency also I would like to ask you this question. Before the agreement on the resolution of conflict in the Republic of South Sudan was to be signed, there has been a complaint and when it was signed, it was also signed with some reservations. Others says this agreement does not uh, address the root causes of the conflict in uh, the Republic of South Sudan. And we know that uh, U.S. is among the countries, uh, or leading country that helps. Uh, they have pushed so hard so that this agreement will be signed. Now, when it comes to the implementation of this agreement, there has been ups and downs when it comes to violations of the agreement. With this, what is the stand of the U.S. government who helped the signing of this agreement? What role have you been playing to make sure that this agreement is implemented in Latin spirit? Well, let's make sure people don't forget the facts. The facts are that the parties themselves negotiated the text of the agreement with input from EGAD neighbors. The name of the agreement is an EGAD agreement on the resolution of the armed conflict in South Sudan. So the United States provided support and input on its own, but often our input was rejected by the parties or rejected by EGAD. Nonetheless, the peace agreement provides a framework to pursue peace if you're interested in peace. And in our view, it contains three core elements that remain relevant, and that each of these three core elements are necessary for you to move forward. The first, as I said, is the permanent ceasefire. You cannot do anything in this country if you don't end the fighting. I think that's obvious. The second is that it contained a power sharing formula. And that power sharing formula recognizes that you are a diverse country with many different communities, all of whom have a stake in governing themselves. And now, as you know, there is a revitalization forum proposed by EGAD to try and rescue the peace agreement. In our view, one of the issues that needs to be reviewed is the power sharing formula because the current arrangement has been overtaken by events and all the parties who need to be included are not yet included. The third core element of the peace agreement were the reform elements. So that got at really tough issues which you know you need to take uh, care of and which you've been discussing for years. They include reform of the SPLA and the Security Service 
services. They include economic reform, so you can get a handle on corruption. And they include a new constitution, so you can determine as a nation how you want to organize your state structures, for example. And they also include a hybrid court. Because one of the root causes of your conflict is that no one is ever held accountable for the terrible abuses they inflict upon different segments of the population. So those are the reasons why we believe there are many elements that remain valid in the peace agreement. No text is perfect. And the agreement contains an important provision which would allow the parties to modify the text uh, to improve it to make sure it addresses their needs. But that would require the parties to take the agreement seriously and work towards its implementation. The government has been complaining about lack of funds to help implement the agreement. And we do understand that the the international community also, your government, you have stopped funding the government directly only on humanitarian ground. With the implementation of this agreement, what impact do you see that uh, it has not supporting the agreement? Do you think this agreement will go ahead without any fund? I think it's inaccurate to say that the international community has not supported through funding the implementation of the peace agreement. First of all, there is a misconception. There was the wrong idea that as soon as the parties signed the agreement, we would give them money. Signing the agreement means nothing if you don't implement it. So the primary responsibility lies with the parties to take action to implement the peace agreement. The United States, for example, has funded many areas of the agreement where there is an opportunity to achieve progress. So for example, we have funded CTSAM, which is the body that was set up to monitor the fighting uh, and any violations of the ceasefire. Uh, We have funded JMEC, which is the body set up by the peace agreement to monitor the impact of the peace agreement and its implementation. What about the Tigono? Uh, uh, No, we will not. As you pointed out correctly, U.S. law prohibits funding of the Tigonu or any national government as long as they are fighting. However, U.S. law does permit some exceptions for funding for the peace agreement. And on Thursday of this week, uh, we will see the opening of the Joint Operations Center, which was called for by the peace agreement uh, to ensure that there is coordination among the many security forces in Juba so that they don't fight among themselves and they play a good role in promoting security for the people of Juba. It will also provide an opening if the regional protection force is allowed to deploy uh, for the RPF uh, to work in coordination with the security forces here. So it will make the capital safer for the people of South Sudan. And because of that, the United States has funded the JOC, the Joint Operations Center. Yes, uh, Your Excellency, you do mention that uh, your policy doesn't allow you to fund uh, the Tigono directly. Yes. Now. Uh, those who are implementing this agreement, they are not the citizens or neither are they the, the JMEC, but they are the warring parties to the conflict. Now, there are some provisions within the agreement which talk about uh, the, the reunification of the army. This requires funds by itself. So by not funding the Tigono, do you think, can it be possible? Well, I think you make a mistake about funding for the Tigonu and funding for the process of implementation. So where we see action to pursue the implementation of the agreement is sincere and balanced and includes all the stakeholders, we have provided money. It is hard right now to envision uh, action in the security chapter because the government is still fighting with the opposition in the country and the opposition has splintered. And so it is not feasible to talk about uh, implementing those security chapters, the, the provisions of the security chapter, while that fighting is taking place. U.S. law and policy also says we will not fund a government that is actively fighting. That's what's happening here. So if they would stop fighting uh, and actively pursue peace, we would be able to find a way to support them. But that's not happening. U.S. law and policy also says we will not give money to a government if there is no transparency and we don't know where the money is going. So if the money goes into just the pockets of government officials, no one in the United States will support that. And no one, frankly, in the international community will support that. So as long as there are these serious problems with corruption and transparency, Transparency and the serious problem with fighting, uh, we will not be able to provide money to the national government. Looking back, uh, is there anything you could personally point it out to as an achievement uh, during your time as a U.S. ambassador in South Sudan? 
Well, I would say the fact that we were able to keep the U.S. Embassy open last July when the ceasefire collapsed and there was fierce fighting in the city was an important achievement. It was an important achievement in three ways. First, we were able to help and support American citizens, which is the primary responsibility of any American embassy. Second, we were able to help and support our partners in the international community. I think many of them would have left if they didn't have the anchor of the U.S. Embassy. And third, I'm very proud that because we stayed open, we were able to maintain our platform to support humanitarian operations in the country, to support those who are suffering from the consequences of armed conflict. So I'm very proud of the U.S. Embassy team, which has worked so hard to support those in need here in the country. Uh, you do mention about your achievement to U.S. Uh, uh, citizens and then also among foreign diplomats here. Now, what about the common South Sudanese people? What are some of the achievements you are able to give to them? Well, I think you neglected uh, what I just said, which is the most important point, mm -hmm. which is one of the most important reasons we keep the U.S. Embassy operating, which is to help those South Sudanese citizens who are suffering from armed conflict through our substantial humanitarian assistance. The American people have provided, uh, the, now the number, it goes up every month, is $2.7 billion in humanitarian assistance. Last month, uh, because of our generous support, as well as other donors, 3 million people were fed by W.S. FP. That couldn't happen without the U.S. Embassy. But Damien, I think it's important to remember that it doesn't really matter who sits in the chair uh, of the ambassador seat for the United States of America. The United States of America wants to see an end to armed conflict in South Sudan and wants to see the South Sudanese people be able to develop the natural resources of this country and be able to stand on their own feet and contribute to East Africa and the African continent. That has always been our goal for the people of South Sudan and that remains our goal and it doesn't matter who sits in the chair. And to that end, I want to announce uh, that this month, uh, USAID will start a new project uh, to help the people of South Sudan begin to feed themselves again, to help them restart agriculture, to help them restart uh, grain farming, to restart fishing, to restart livestock management, small animal management. And that will be a three-year project at a cost of $27 million, which will work in cooperation with the FAO, which is the UN Agency Food and Agricultural Organization. And that will be accompanied by additional funding, uh, about $20 million, to a UN body here that builds small roads to help people get agricultural products to the market. Because you have spent too many years being dependent on foreign aid, primarily U.S. foreign aid, uh, to feed yourselves. Uh, you remember in 1989 when there was the terrible famine in Bahal Gazelle, uh, the international community under the leadership of the UN and with major financing from the United States States started Operation Lifeline Sudan. And who would imagine that we're back in the year 2017 with famine again and severe food insecurity. So it's important to help you move away from this culture of dependency and be able to take advantage of the great natural resources you have in this country. And that's what we're going to try and do with the, the, that project. Your Excellency, having mentioned some of the achievements you do talk about, now what are some of the biggest challenges that you encounter during your time in South Sudan? Well, I think the, uh, for me and the team at the embassy, uh, the biggest challenge we find is uh, that we uh, find it very hard to see so many people suffering. It's actually on a human level uh, very sad uh, to see people who don't have enough to eat and to see people who don't have jobs uh, and to see people who can't get an education that they desire and can't contribute uh, to building this great country. Uh, so that, I would say, is the biggest challenge, uh, the pain that we see around us. The U.S. government has been pushing for sanctions against South Sudanese leadership. Uh, if imposed, how will this sanction help in restoring peace in the country? Well, the objective of the sanction is not to punish, but to encourage or discourage certain kinds of behavior. So we want to encourage people to use their positions of authority and power to try and solve the country's problems. Uh, and so by um, calling out and singling out people who are actually using their position to stop solutions, uh, we're hoping to discourage that kind of behavior and encourage others to take a more positive route. I would like also to ask this question as we approach to the end of our discussion. Uh, to all of you who are tuning in to Bakita Radio, please, this is a pre-recorded program. I don't call. Ambassador, your country has a new president. 
Donald Trump, who has made it very clear that U.S. foreign policy approach is America first. How will this affect South Sudan? Well, I'm so glad you brought up that question, because if I were a leader of South Sudan, what I would be considering right now is what kind of partnership do I want to have with the United States? I might consider the role the United States has played in South Sudanese history and consider, do I want that role to continue? And if the leadership of South Sudan would like the United States to remain a strong partner of South Sudan, then the leadership will need to take actions that make the Trump administration interested in engaging and expanding that partnership. And in some areas, we've had many difficulties. Uh, you know there has been a lot of government harassment of humanitarian aid workers, and we have spoken about that quite forcefully. The purpose of American aid is to help those in need. Uh, and we uh, are concerned uh, that those who are trying to get food and other critical supplies out to those in need um, who are suffering from the fighting have been blocked uh, by government security services and have been threatened by government institutions and have been um, uh, asked for excessive taxes and fees. And in fact, the government signed a treaty with the United States that said our partners in the humanitarian and development field would be exempt for taxes and fees to make it easier for them to help the country. So those are the kinds of actions that the Trump administration will look at. Is the government a good partner for the United States? Is it worth more investment in South Sudan or not? Finally, as we come to an end of uh, this uh, special uh, interview, uh, before we leave you, Ambassador, what needs to be done to get South Sudan out of its current suffering? And then also as an outgoing ambassador uh, of South Sudan, what message do you also have to all the South Sudanese citizens? Well, in terms of what needs to be done, I'll, I'll repeat myself because it's so important. <laughs> you need to stop fighting. Uh, armed conflict is not a way to solve your political problems. So people need to put down the guns uh, and begin to rebuild the country. You have tremendous natural resources. First of all, your people. Your people are amazing and they're incredibly talented and capable. Uh, and you also have many resources in terms of water, in terms of land. Uh, you know those, Damien, right? So you just need an opportunity, some space and time to take advantage of those resources, and you could be on a completely different path. What I want the South Sudanese people to remember is that everyone wants you to succeed. Uh, the United States wants you to succeed, and the measures we take are designed to encourage success, whether they are positive measures, which we regret the government hasn't responded to, or whether they are measures to push uh, so that you get to a different uh, situation, you get to a different reality, and you get to realize the hopes and dreams you all had upon independence. Well, uh, thank you so much for your time, uh, Ambassador. On behalf of myself and audience, I would like to wish you all the best in your uh, next adventure. Listeners, we have come to the end of this special program that uh, looks at the United States of America foreign policy engagement in South Sudan. Our guest in the studio has been Her Excellency Ambassador Mary Catherine Molipi. Thank you for coming. When are you leaving? Uh, thank you, Damien. I'm leaving next week, but if I might, I'd like to add one point. I want to say a special thank you uh, to the South Sudan Council of Churches and also to the Roman Catholic Church, uh, which has been such a good friend to me, giving me good advice, um, and most importantly, is such a good friend to the people of South Sudan. And I have great admiration and respect uh, for the role of the church uh, in South Sudanese life, and I wish you all the best in helping your constituents. Thank you so much. Thank you.